Now, therefore, when you come to the point when you understand that your idea of yourself is a delusion married to a futility, there is nothing you can do about the one thing that has to be done, which is to be different. There's nothing you can do about it. You realize that. Then what happens? What follows? The only thing that can follow is that you, as we say, observe what is going on. You cannot reject life. You cannot accept it. It simply has to happen. And it happens. It keeps going on. There is this vibration and that vibration. This thought, this feeling, this sensation. Chitter, 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 chitter. Commentary going on it all out of the memory bank. All that happens. And all you can do is watch it. Can't change it. Because there's no separate you standing outside it to change it. What is happening is you. And you say, I don't know about this. Who's in, who's in charge around here? Well, nobody is in charge. Nobody ever was in charge. Because the, the nature of energy is such that it doesn't need anyone to govern it. <laughs> it doesn't have to have something separate from itself to make it do what it does. When you know for sure that your separate ego is a fiction, you actually feel yourself as the whole person process and pattern of life. Experience and experiencer become one experiencing, known and knower one knowing. Remember above all that an experience of this kind cannot be forced or made to happen by any act of your fictitious will, except in so far as repeated efforts to be one up on the universe may eventually reveal their futility. Don't try to get rid of the ego sensation. Take it, so long as it lasts, as a feature or play of the total process, like a cloud or wave, or like feeling warm or cold, or anything else that happens of itself. Getting rid of one's ego is the last resort of invincible egoism. It simply confirms and strengthens the reality of the feeling. But when this feeling of separateness is approached and accepted like any other sensation, it evaporates like the mirage it is. If then you ask me how to get beyond the ego feeling, I shall ask you why you want to get there. If you give me an honest answer, which is that your ego will feel better in the higher spiritual status of self-transcendence, you will thus realize that you, as ego, are a fake. You will feel like an onion. Skin after skin, subterfuge after subterfuge, is pulled off to reveal no kernel at the center. Which is the whole point, to find out that the ego is indeed a fake, a wall of defense around a wall of defense around nothing. You can't even want to get rid of it, nor yet want to want to. Understand this, and you will see that the ego is exactly what it pretends it isn't. Far from being the free center of personality, it is an automatic mechanism implanted since childhood by social authority, with perhaps a touch of heredity thrown in. This may give you the temporary feeling of being a zombie or a puppet dancing irresponsibly on strings. What has happened is that the frustrated ego has withdrawn into its last stronghold of independence, retaining its identity as a mere watcher or sufferer of all that goes on. Here it pities itself or consoles itself as a puppet of fate. But if this is seen as yet another subterfuge, we are close to the final showdown. A line of separation is now drawn between everything that happens to me, including my own feeling on the one side, and on the other, I myself as the conscious witness. Isn't it easy to see that this line is imaginary, and that it and the witness behind it are the same old faking process automatically learned in childhood? Yet, in this moment, when one seems about to become a really total zombie, the whole thing blows up. For there is no fate unless there is someone or something to be fated. There is no trap without someone to be caught. There is indeed no compulsion unless there is also freedom of choice. For the sensation of behaving involuntarily is known only by contrast with that of behaving voluntarily. Thus, when the line between myself and what happens to me is dissolved, and there is no stronghold left for an ego, even as a passive witness, I find myself not in a world but as a world, which is neither compulsive nor capricious. 
What happens is neither automatic nor arbitrary, it simply happens. And all happenings are mutually interdependent in a way that seems unbelievably harmonious. When this new sensation of self arises, it is at once exhilarating and a little disconcerting. It is like the moment when you first got the knack of swimming or riding a bicycle. There is the feeling that you are not doing it yourself, but that it is somehow happening on its own. And you wonder whether you will lose it, as indeed you may if you try forcibly to hold on to it. In immediate contrast to the old feeling, there is indeed a certain passivity to the sensation, as if you were a leaf blown along by the wind, until you realize that you are both the leaf and the wind. The world outside your skin is just as much you as the world inside. They move together inseparably. And at first you feel a little out of control, because the world outside is so much vaster than the world inside. Yet you soon discover that you are able to go ahead with ordinary activities, to work and make decisions as before, though somehow this is less of a drag. Your body is no longer a corpse which the ego has to animate and lug around. There is a feeling of the ground holding you up and of hills lifting you when you climb them. Air breathes itself in and out of your lungs, and instead of looking and listening, light and sound come to you on their own. Eyes see and ears hear as wind blows and water flows. All space becomes your mind. Time carries you along like a river, but never flows out of the present. The more it goes, the more it stays, and you no longer have to fight or kill it. Once you have seen this, you can return to the world of practical affairs with a new spirit. You have seen that the universe is at root a magical illusion and a fabulous game, and that there is no separate you to get something out of it, as if life were a bank to be robbed. The only real you is the one that comes and goes, manifests and withdraws itself eternally in and as every conscious being. For you means the universe looking at itself from billions of points of view, points that come and go so that the vision is forever new. Anyone who brags about knowing this doesn't understand it, for he is only using the theory as a trick to maintain his illusion of separateness, a gimmick in a game of spiritual one-upmanship. Moreover, such bragging is deeply offensive to those who do not understand and who honestly believe themselves to be lonely individual spirits in a desperate and agonizing struggle for life. For all such, there must be deep and unpatronizing compassion, even a special kind of reverence and respect, because, after all, in them the self is playing its most far-out and daring game, the game of having lost itself completely and of being in danger of some total and irremediable disaster. It comes then to this, that to be viable, livable, or merely practical, life must be lived as a game, and the must here expresses a condition, not a commandment. Life must be lived in the spirit of play rather than work, and the conflicts which it involves must be carried on in the realization that no species or party to a game can survive without its natural antagonists, its beloved enemies, its indispensable opponents. For to love your enemies is to love them as enemies. It is not necessarily a clever device for winning them over to your own side. As it is, we are merely bolting our lives, gulping down undigested experiences as fast as we can stuff them in, like frantic Christmas shoppers. Our awareness of our own existence is so superficial and so narrow that nothing seems to us more boring than simply being. If I ask you what you did, saw, heard, smelled, touched, and tasted yesterday, I'm likely to get nothing more than the thin, sketchy outline of the few things that you noticed, and of those, only what you thought worth remembering. Is it surprising that an existence experienced in this way seems so empty and bare that its hunger for an infinite future is insatiable? But suppose you could answer, it would take me forever to tell you, and I am much too interested in what's happening now. How is it possible that a being with such sensitive jewels as the eyes, such enchanted musical instruments as the ears, and such a fabulous arabesque of nerves as the brain, can experience itself as anything less than God? And when you consider that this incalculably subtle organism is inseparable from the still more marvelous patterns of its environment, from the minutest electrical designs to the whole company of the galaxies, 
How is it conceivable that this incarnation of all eternity can be bored with being?